the way the Buddha discusses the problem of suffering and stress is very much like an eating disorder. After all, the word clinging, upadana, can also refer to the act of taking sustenance, it's the way you eat things. And of course, he's not talking only about physical food, he's talking about mental and emotional food as well. And so look at how you feed on things. He gives you a, a framework for looking at it. You're clinging to the five aggregates. And it's important to realize that aggregates are not things. It's not a pile of gravel that's weighing you down. It's a series of activities that you get accustomed to, and you keep doing them over and over again. And the activities themselves relate to how you feed. The question often comes up, why did the Buddha divide things into five aggregates? Whether there are six or seven, there are lots of different mental processes going on in the mind. But the way you look at your mind really depends on the activity that you're engaged in. And we're engaged in feeding. We are concerned about form, i.e. our body. And if it's physical food, you're concerned about the object you're feeding on. There's feeling, which is the feeling of hunger you have to begin with and the feeling of satisfaction you want after you're done. And there's also the pleasure or displeasure that comes as you feed on a particular kind of food. There's perception. A perception of what kind of hunger is this? Is this a hunger for something salty? Is it a hunger for something sweet? And then looking out and trying to perceive what kind of foods there are out there that would satisfy your hunger. And trying to figure out what, to begin with, is edible and what's not. Then there's fabrication. All the activities you have to go through in order to get that food. Starting with a search, and then when you find it, what you have to do to fix it. But you can actually feed on it. And then consciousness, of course, is just the awareness of all these things. And it's interesting that we feed off of the activities that go around feeding. It's a double layer here. This applies not only to physical feeding, but also to emotional feeding. Certain feelings you want, and then your perception of what would be a good way to get those feelings, and then all the activity that you go into in order to achieve the feelings you want. So if you find yourself addicted to something, try to divide it into these things. Okay, what's the form? What are the feelings? Where are the perceptions? What are the fabrications? What's the consciousness? One of the reasons we get the mind into concentration is because that's a good way to feed. It's a harmless way to feed the mind. And at the same time, because the mind is centered right here, you can see these activities as you're engaged in them. You're sitting here with the form of the body. How do you notice the form of the body? Well, there are the, the different elements. There's earth, water. Wind, fire, the space around it, the space penetrating it. And these are the kinds of sensations that let you know that you've got a body here. And it's a useful vocabulary to have. Think about what you're feeling in the body in terms of heaviness, or the energy of the wind, the warmth of the heat, the coolness of the water. You want to learn how to bring these things into balance. And to do that, of course, you have to notice them and figure out well, what's the imbalance here. We start with the breath, but eventually we start getting running into the other elements, too. There's warm breathing and cool breathing. There are times when you feel really heavy and it's almost impossible to breathe. Some forms of concentration clamp down really hard. You find that happening, you have to remind yourself that what you experience here is primarily through the breath element to begin with. If it weren't for that, you would notice the warmth or the coolness or the heaviness. There'd be no way of making contact at all. So the breath is there already. 
try to make it primary. And don't think that the earth element is setting up a blockade around it. So we want to make this sense of the form comfortable. And we use the breath of, of the various elements. That's the one that's most responsive to the movements of the mind. And the one that has a control over the other ones. It's one of the few bodily processes that we can actually exert some control over just by watching it. So while you're sitting here, ask yourself, what kind of breathing would be good now? And it's not just, of course, the breathing. There's going to be feelings associated with, well, how can you breathe in a way that gives rise to a sense of pleasure? And while you're dealing with this, you're going to be noticing how do you perceive the breath? What's the mental image you have of the breath? How it comes in, how it goes out, where it's coming in, where it's going out. Then you talk to yourself about it. That's fabrication. You ask yourself questions. Is the breath as comfortable as it could be, or could it be more comfortable? Is the breath energy evenly distributed throughout the body, or are there parts that are starved and other parts that are too breathy? Try to sensitize yourself to this. I hear over and over again people saying, well, what, what are you talking about, breath in the body? There's no breath in the body, there's just breath in the lungs. What's well, a huge insensitivity on their part? It's right here. It's just learning how to look at it from this perspective, and you learn that you can then create a nice place to settle down here, something nice to feed on, to be aware of. That's the consciousness right here. So this is a healthy form of feeding. You're sitting here, you're not killing anything to be fed. You're not feeding on any physical food that's, even if it's vegetarian or vegan, it's not, you're not required to live off the, or feed off the work of some farm or someplace. And it's a pleasure, it's a sense of well-being that the mind can feed on that doesn't cloud it. So many of the mind's pleasures really cloud it. You take pleasure out of a particular person, and you have to ignore certain things about that person, and certain things about the lust that's coming up in you, or the emotional hunger that's coming up in you, that blind you to a lot of things. This is a pleasure with relatively few blinders. So training the mind to get over its eating disorder in one way is by giving us something better to feed on and a better way to feed. The Buddha compares the different levels of jhana to different kinds of food. So what kind of food are you going to fix for yourself tonight? And how are you going to feed off it? You'll notice that if you try to gobble it all down, you've lost it. In other words, once the mind gets to a level of stillness, you try to grab onto it, and the grabbing, of course, is going to squeeze the breath, and there you go. It's not there anymore. Or if you look down on it and say, oh, this isn't good food, I want, I want insight, I want something higher than this, the mind's going to get really hungry. And when the mind is hungry, it goes back to its old feeding ways. One of the strangest things you hear in meditation circles is that concentration is dangerous and you don't want to get stuck on it. Well, people don't get stuck on concentration, go back getting stuck on their own sensual ways of feeding, because the mind has this need to feed all the time, as long as it's not awakened. So the question is, are you going to be feeding skillfully or not? And if you can't create a nice sense of jhana food right here, right now, the mind's going to slip off to its, its old ways of feeding. So even though this isn't the ultimate of the practice, it's an important stage. As the Buddha once said, if you can't get this kind of pleasure going, there's no way you're going to be able to let go of the pleasures, of sensual pleasures. No matter how much you may know about the drawbacks of sensual pleasures, just keep coming back because you don't have anything else to feed off of. Or you start feeding off of unskillful emotions. Like you may decide that you've got some attainment or something, you feed off the pride around that. So having a good sense of concentration, a good sense of the breath and how to work with the breath, this is how you feed the mind and put it in a position where you can look at what are the 
more subtle feeding disorders you might have. This is where the Buddha gets into the four different kinds of clinging, or sensual clinging to begin with, or your fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures. Notice the pleasures themselves are not the problem. The problem is that you like to fantasize about them again and again and again, or reminisce about them again and again. That's an eating disorder. Or you're stuck on certain habits, certain practices. These can be skillful or unskillful. As we're working, of course, we do have to work with skillful habits to develop skillful habits, but we have to realize that they're a means. They're not the end. Clinging to habits and clinging to practices is the attitude that if I obey all the rules, I'm going to be a good person and that's all I have to do is just do what I'm told. Or have my certain way of doing things that's going to be done that way. It's like the person who has to have a particular piece of food cooked in just a certain way, like that cartoon with Calvin and his mother. Insist, Calvin insists he wants his sandwiches cut diagonally and he wants the crusts cut off. And he wants a certain kind of bread. And the mother doesn't do it that way, and he gets all goes all berserk. A lot of us are like that. Things have to be just a particular kind of way, and then we'll be happy. They have to be done like this, done like that. That's an eating disorder, too. Then there are views, certain views we have about things that have nothing to do with the practice. Again, we have to use views. We have to have right view in order to practice. But there's a belief that if you look at things a certain way, simply the fact that you have a particular view or have a particular opinion, that makes you good, that makes you better than other people. Again, we're not here to be better than other people or to cling to the view. We're here to use the view so we can understand suffering and get beyond it. And there's views about what you are, who you are, yourself. And again, these are things we have to use in the practice. But if you hold on to a particular view and don't realize that it's a means, then you've got problems. It's like trying to eat your utensils, eating your forks, eating your knives, eating your spoons. These are things just meant to be used for a purpose, not to be eaten in and of themselves. Sensuality doesn't have much use as a, as a utensil. You need a certain amount of pleasure, and you need a certain amount of food, clothing, shelter, medicine. This is why we have those reflections on the, pre, on the requisites every night, every night, every night. Other chants get varied, but that one is the same one every night, because this is a big issue. If we're not careful, we just get really obsessed with our food, obsessed with the clothing we're wearing, obsessed with where we're staying. It turns into sensual pleasure, sensual fascination, sensual obsession. So we reflect on how much is really necessary, what's just right, and it turns out we don't need all that much. And then we can focus on these other utensils that we've got to use, and learn how to use them as utensils. How to use your forks, how to use your knives, how to use your spoons, instead of just gobbling them down. So we can see, once the mind gets still, how you're using a view, what the results of the view are, what habits you have, what practices and precepts you have, and to what extent they're really useful for clarifying the mind, to what extent you're creating problems out of them. What you identify with, what you have to learn how to disidentify with, and in what order. We don't just kind of throw the self out. We find that we've got lots of selves in here, and some of the selves are useful and some of them are problems. So we have to learn how to sort those out. So there's work to be done once the mind is settled and still. It requires digging around, uncovering different layers of 
feeding on different, different layers of unskillful habits. But it's work that can be done, and we can learn how to overcome this eating disorder we have. Where we want to be fed, want to be well fed, and yet the mind is constantly creating suffering for itself over the way it eats. Not only that, suffering for others. Because ultimately what we want to do is find a state of mind that doesn't need to feed at all. It's just there. It doesn't require any conditions. It's interesting that when the Buddha introduces the topic of conditionality to young novices in the novices question, he uses the image of feeding. Everything that requires conditions in order to keep it going, he says, look at it as a kind of feeding. And you begin to realize we have lots of eating disorders, not the obvious ones. In some cases there are the obvious ones, but others are a lot more subtle. The Buddha gives you an analysis of the problem and the tools for solving the problem, a range of vocabulary for understanding the different things that are going on, and a recommendation for what to do with them so the mind can get strengthened, give it the good food of concentration, sense of well-being that comes from generosity and virtue. And the mind gets stronger and stronger. You need the conviction in your in the practice. That strengthens you. You have to be persistent. You have to be mindful. Develop concentration so you can have the, the discernment that sees these things clearly. This is how you strengthen the mind to the point where it finds something inside that doesn't need to feed. And that's when your eating disorders end.